Head over to BoardGamePrices.com to find the best price and availability for thousands of games. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. I just got back from the craziness of Gen Con late last night, and today I thought I would put out a video for you about the top 10 things that I saw at Gen Con. Uh, if you've never been there before, this is gonna be cool. If you have been, you'll see some things new as well. And even if you were there, you'll probably see some things that maybe you missed because there's you just can't see everything there so this list is gonna be made up of different things some games some things about gen con itself so here we go number 10 Number 10, uh, I'm gonna talk about the food in and around. You know, a lot of times you go to conventions and sometimes they're not in great spots to go walk out and get food, but Indianapolis downtown is definitely a place where there's tons of options. Of course, you have the general food trucks and such, which have really long lines and such. But I'm gonna highlight a couple of things that I did there for food that was different from what I've done before and I'm definitely gonna do them again. First of all, there is a Wild Bill soda out there. It is by the food trucks. It was kind of cool. You could buy a, a mug. They, were, they, were, they ranged from like $20 to $40, depending on which mug you got. And you had free refills for the day. And then the ne any other day, you could spend $5 and get free refills. The, the mugs were really large. I think they were about 24 ounces. They had all sorts of uh, pure sugar cane soda. You know, they had grape and root beer and sarsaparilla and black cherry and all sorts of stuff. And it was really fun to go out there and get soda and fill up there. Uh, and the soda was really good. It was kind of a cool experience there. Another one was a, a place called Shapiro's. It was sort of a, a, a Jewish deli and bakery. And we had heard from some of the uh, Uber drivers that they have like, the best Reuben sandwich. And went there, got the Reuben. It was absolutely fantastic, sort of cafeteria style eating. It was about a 10, 11 minute walk from downtown. And when we went, the, you know, the, the, the lines weren't that long and it was absolutely delicious. I'm gonna be going back there every day to Shapiro's. And the last one there is called Bangkok Restaurant and Jazz Bar. This one was a, another about 10 minutes from downtown, a little bit close to that sort of city center there with the big, uh, uh, you know, the, the circle with the waterfalls and such. Close walking by, man, was this a steal to find this place. It was quiet on Friday and Saturday, had jazz. I, obviously you guys see me play saxophone serenades. They had a piano player and a sax player, had a delicious orange chicken meal for just $13. It ended up being about four meals worth. Got to take some back to the hotel. Liked it so much, went back to the next night, listened to a trumpeter and a piano player, got another meal. Not expensive, not too busy because it's far enough away. That's a hidden gem there, Bangkok restaurant and jazz bar. Number nine. The next one is a game. Uh, it's one I actually, I'm a little embarrassed to say I didn't know about this before I got there. It's called Funkoverse Strategy Game. This is from Funko. Uh, this is a, you know, it's two to four players. And basically you're going to be combining your favorite characters and go head to head in different game scenarios. You'll be using your character's unique abilities to gain points and achieve victory. And each character, you know, has access to basic actions like moving, but they also have several unique abilities that may be performed, you know, only by spending ability tokens. And it uses this cooldown system where the more powerful the ability, the longer it will take for the ability token to become available again. So players have to sort of spend their ability tokens wisely and use some strategy with that. Each character in the Funkoverse is unique, so as player, you know, players are encouraged to try out different combinations of characters and items in order to discover their favorite synergies and powerful strategies. Uh, they have different sets there. They had a Harry Potter set. They had a Golden Girls set. They had a Rick and Morty. They had DC, which had Batman, Joker, Holly Quinn, uh, and, and Catwoman, I believe. Uh, they come in, in basically two packs and four packs. Uh, each is a standalone game. The four packs are re retail for $39.99. Uh, and the two packs are $24.99. They're gonna be coming out, I believe, October 1st in different stores, both mass market stores and hobby stores. I know for the mass market stores, they're only gonna, each one of those is gonna hold like certain types of characters, where I believe the hobby uh, world, uh, the hobby section is gonna be carrying, uh, I think possibly more than that. I think all of them possibly. Uh, each comes with two playable mats, uh, and, and you can play these as standalone or mix them with other Funkoverse games. So this just seemed interesting. It looks cool set up. It's got that sort of, you know, the, the intellectual property appeal to the mass markets. And what I hear is, is it's, you know, I didn't get a chance to play it, but I watched a demo. It does look like it's one of those things that's approachable for mass market, but does have a light strategy there. Something fun to get people into board gaming. Uh, and that's Funkoverse strategy game. Number eight. 
Now every year, uh, I've been blessed enough to be able to get into the hall before it opens. And you may have seen the pictures or heard about all the hoopla of how many people are trying to bust through the doors and get the hot games that there's only a few of them per day rationed out. So I always like to stand where the hall opens and it's, it's sort of a yearly tradition for me because as they open the doors five minutes before, you hear the organizers get 60,000 people yelling, do not run, do not run, and everyone's chanting. And it's, it's just a fun little thing that happens every year. And as they start to come in, I, I like to sort of video this and to sort of time lapse it as you see here, as they're you know, flying through and all these people coming in and seeing the hall opening, if you've never seen that before, something you gotta see at Gen Con because you don't see things like this anywhere else. Number seven. The next one was one that was sort of announced just before the show started. Fantasy Flight's known for sort of keeping things airtight, nothing leaks out, we never know what they're gonna release. Uh, and so they released Marvel Champions, the card game. Now, this is a cooperative living card game for one to four players, and you'll be taking on the roles of iconic heroes from the Marvel Universe as they try to stop the infamous villains from enacting their devious schemes. Now, you'll play as in this base set as either Iron Man, Captain Marvel, Spider-Man, Black Panther, or She-Hulk, combining your powers with your fellow heroes to take down the rampaging Rhino, the Cunning Claw, or the utterly terrifying Ultron. Each villain comes with its own encounter deck, and there's different schemes which provide a different experience each time that you play the game. Now, since it's a living card game, uh, they're gonna be having a new expansion each month, which is going to allow you to get into the game, the base game, and then continue to have different uh, scenarios, different schemes, different villains, different heroes and such coming out all the time. This was, this. Uh, there was a ton of buzz of this at Gen Con. Uh, I didn't get a chance to actually demo this, but I watched over people playing this, and I've talked to people playing it. Uh, a lot of people, Everyone that I played it with says, oh my gosh, I love this. This is the best cooperative card game I've played. I like it much better than Marvel Legendary, things like that. So I've heard a lot of great things and I'm looking forward to getting my hands on this when it comes out. Number six. The next one was a booth that I stopped by. It's sort of gaming related. Very interesting. When I was a kid, you know, uh, a lot of the Atari games were made by a popular company called Activision. Well, this booth was called Artovision, and it sort of looked like Activision. They had these amazing shadow boxes that you could hang on your wall. They also had small desk ones as well. Uh, and they were basically like these old arcade games, like Dragon's Lair. Oh my gosh, that was a game I loved as a kid. It was the first game ever that was 50 cents to play, and you were done in like a minute, and it was a laser disc. They had Donkey Kong, they had Spy Hunter, Rampage, Tapper all these old arcade games and it was like a three-dimensional shadow box where they actually had the glass that made it look like it was sort of the glass of the arcade game and then behind it they had the game they had uh, punch out oh my gosh i saw these and i just fell in love with them now they were very expensive i think they were about 130 dollars each i didn't pull the trigger now because i had eight of them that i wanted right then and i couldn't make up my mind so i'm gonna wait and think about it throughout the year they do have an online store i might buy it at or maybe i'll go back next year and have the one planned out but those things were so cool and those were artovision Number five. The next one was another one that I think I had heard about in the past, but I had heard about it so long ago I sort of forgot it was coming. Uh, but they had it, there was Splendor, the Marvel version of Splendor. Uh, and it's not just a reskin of Splendor, there are some differences there. I did get a chance to sit down and demo this for a little bit. Um, and I did take some pictures, but I'm un unfortunately unable to show those to you because there was some artwork there that was not final and I'm not allowed to show those in an official video. Uh, so I'll just show you the banner of what it looked like and then I'll talk about it here. So if you're familiar with Splendor, uh, this, uh, this version has a few differences. Obviously the theme, obviously the, the icons and the, what's on the card, things like that. But mechanically, uh, the most interesting thing is there's a new Avenger token. And certain cards will have one or two Avenger icons on them. And the person that has the most of those in front of them will take that Avenger token. It's worth three points at that time. But similar to like Longest Road in uh, Settlers of Catan, if someone else gets more Avenger icons in front of them, they will take that from you. So that three points can sort of move around and you can time it right to try to win the game. That was the most interesting new twist here. Also, instead of just getting 15 points, they took sort of a page out of the city, uh, the, the expansion of Splendor, the cities module. And basically now you, in order to win, you have to get, I believe it was 16 points and one of each of the cards. Plus, you also have to have one of the top rows. So you no longer can you just build that engine not go for the top rows and go for the nobles. You gotta get this. So a little bit of the city's expansion there. 
I don't know if there's more than one. I think it's just that one where you got to get 16 points of one of everything, including one of the top. And then the last little twist is instead of having nobles, you know, it's like cities and things like that. It works the same way, but instead of having three out there, they have four out there. Um, now, when we played, uh, the tokens themselves were cardboard, and I'm not sure if that's gonna, if it was just prototype or if it's gonna. Because one of the things I've already been asked about when I posted is, are they gonna have the poker chips? Uh, like the real Splinter game has, and I'm not sure yet. You're going to have to keep your eyes peeled, but the ones we played with were uh, uh, cardboard tokens. But we'll have to see what, what ends up coming out. But I like the changes they made. Uh, I actually like it better than the base game of Splinter because of those little twists. And if you like Marvelous, is a no-brainer. Number four. Now, next one is things in and around the convention hall. Uh, number one, uh, I know that they have sort of expanded over the last few years to the Lucas Oil Stadium. And last year, I walked down that little hallway. It has a lot of old-style arcade games. And in there, once you get to Lucas Oil, it's really a lot of role-playing things and such. And so I've been there before, but this year, I went up the escalators and into the stadium, which was cool for me. I'm a huge sports fan. I love football, baseball, all the, all the major sports. And so I'd never been in where the Indianapolis Colts play before, looking around all the blue seats and thinking, wow, this is where Peyton Manning played. And looking down, but man, they had so many event tables set up with people playing games. I couldn't believe how many people were down there uh, just playing games with all these set up. And they already have a humongous event hall, and many halls over in the regular convention center to see this many there. Wow, I was just really impressed with how many people were there gaming, so that's cool. The other thing that's always fun at the... Uh, you know, at these things are the giant games. Uh, there was a giant ticket to ride, huge box, huge way to play it. They had these big buses that literally it takes up your entire hand and you're putting them out on the on the table. The the, the large versions of games that you see at the conventions are always fun, uh, and so that was that was sort of cool. They had this huge rock'em sock'em robots thing where you could actually like box it and punch it and make its neck you know jump up. Uh, so there was, and there's also huge things like Bezier Games have the big werewolf out front, things like that to take pictures with, and that's always fun. Uh, they also have every year this sort of card stacking where players, well, mostly magic cards, people are, are stacking them. Now, when you get in there on Tuesday or Wednesday, it's just starting. It's very empty. It looks something like this. Uh, but as the week goes on, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the end. And then I think on Saturday night, they auction off people to throw things at them for charity. Uh, and then people sort of destroy it. And it's always sort of a fun little thing. So those are always a lot of fun, unique things at Gen Con in and around the convention hall. Number three. The next one is a game I got a chance to check out. I didn't play the whole thing, but I sort of went through a couple of rounds there and saw how it's played. Uh, this is called The Search for Planet X. Now, this is a deduction game. It's from Foxtrot Games. It's going to be coming to Kickstarter in September. And this, players take on the role of astronomers, and you're using observations and logical deductions to search for this hypothetical planet X. Now, each game, there's a, there's a companion app, and it randomly selects an arrangement of objects and location for planet X, following sort of a predefined logic rules. Uh, and this was really interesting because, you know, there's like asteroid fields and it tells you, well, it could be in this one or this one. And there's always two or maybe it's next to this one. Um, and, and, and so there's all, there's all these different types of things that you can find and different ways that they relate to each other. Uh, and the app was really cool. It, it was functional. It, it, and, and basically that's going to help set that up. And you're going through and saying what action. Basically, you have different timed actions. So certain more powerful actions take more time and you move a little bit further. And other players might take multiple actions before you get another turn. Similar to say like Thebes, an older game where you know you can take an action and you might have to wait a little bit, but that's cool because you get a lot of information. Uh, has that going on with it? Has this little thing where you know the, 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 the you know space is sort of churning as to which areas you can actually ask about. That as time goes on, you get more and more information. You're trying to publish theories about what you think is where. Uh, and over the course of the game, as time goes on, people will get to see what those theories are. And you can even win the game by publishing a lot of good theories and not even being the person that finds planet, uh, the, the Planet X, which seemed kind of cool. So anyway, I love deduction games. This one looks awesome. It sounds awesome. It, it, thematically, it works. It uses a lot of mechanisms I like. And it just looked really cool. And I love to see more and more deductions out there. This is coming out from Foxtrot Games in September. The Search for Planet X. And it's designed by the same design team that did Between Two Cities and Between Two... Uh, uh, castles of Mad King Ludwig that I really loved as well. Number two. The number two, uh, well, it wouldn't be Gen Con without cosplayers, right? And so saw a lot of really cool costumes there. Uh, these were my favorite. Uh, these two guys were walking around on stilts after the parade. They were getting a lot of attention. They were nice enough to kind of 
uh, get a picture with me. Uh, but in addition to seeing all the cosplayers around all, all week long, on Saturday they have a costume parade, and it's always fun to kind of stand out and watch all these costumes walk by. I mean, we saw some really cool things like, you know, Green Dragon, and someone was walking on, like, these animal sort of hoofs, and I don't even know how they were balancing. Some of them had, like, these servo helmets. They were like, zzz, zzz, and they were, like, moving around, and... It's just really fun. It's family friendly, um, you know, but it was cool to kind of watch them go through. They went through the whole halls. They went through the outside where, where we got a chance to watch it. Uh, and the, the parade is really cool. If you've never been there before to Gen Con, you got to go to the parade and check it out. Number one. And the number one thing at Gen Con and the number one thing at any convention I go to, because this is why I play board game, is the people. Uh, games are nothing without people. It's why my whole... Uh, the reason why I do this is to break down barriers and, and grow a relationship through board games by helping you find the next board game you'll love because I've seen board games bring people together uh, in such an amazing way. It's always about the people. It's always about meeting fans. Uh, I got to meet a lot of you there. Uh, some of them, uh, Jamie here was, was nice enough to take a selfie and post it on my Twitter account. So I got a picture, you know, copy of that to show you guys. Uh, it's always fun to see my fellow media creators. I uh, got to hang out at the Man vs. Meeple studio one night with some other uh, media creators and publishers and play some games and things like that. I actually got to play Ishtar with them there. I got to hang out in the studio a little bit. Ran into designers like Alan Moon, the designer of Ticket to Ride. Where else do you run into him at? He was hanging out with Ted Ausbach. I got to see John D. Clare, who's done a lot of great things uh, like Custom Heroes and Mystic Veil. Vale. Uh, Space Base, and now Ecos, which is his upcoming Essen release, which is absolutely amazing. Nick Metzler from uh, Spin Master, who, who's done sort of the Wakanda Forever and, and some other games there. Uh, got to see Ted Ausbach and Ali from Bezier Games and stuff. So seeing all these people, the designers, they'll sign your games when you buy them. Uh, the best thing about Gen Con is the people. And then just the gamers as well, just hanging on. Everyone was so, so friendly. Uh, it's just like Gen Con is like nothing else. It has electricity in the air that you can actually feel, which I haven't felt at any other convention. And it's a ton of fun. And that has been my Gen Con recap. That was number one. Well, I hope this helped you see all the different sights and sounds of Gen Con. If you haven't been there before, maybe point out something that you didn't see, even if you were there. Now, I am going to be very busy coming soon because I brought back four suitcases full of games so I can start getting through and playing games and reviewing them for you and finding the next board game for you because that's what I do. Uh, and obviously the reason for doing that is breaking down barriers and growing relationships through board games by helping you find the next one you love. So I'm going to be very busy doing this with those four suitcases full of games. And in case you ever wondered, this is how we get off the plane and get back to the car with all these games. This is how you bring my four suitcases of games from Gen Con. Did you miss the Game Topper 2.0 Kickstarter? Have no fear, it's not too late to get in on the ultimate gaming accessory. Convert your table into a high quality gaming table with a fully portable game topper system and take advantage of some of the best 3mm premium gaming mats in the industry. New styles, new sizes, and new accessories can be yours. Upgrade every game you play by late backing now at GameToppersLLC.com.